welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God. I need you to present your hearts to the Lord. You know, we haven't come to hear from a man. We haven't come to hear from a woman. We haven't come to hear from a black man or a white man. We haven't come to hear from a brown man. We haven't come to hear from a tall man, an old man, a young man. We've come to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. That's what we ought to be listening for, the voice of God in every church service, wherever in, wherever you're at, that you listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit. And God wants to speak to you today about your heart. Will you listen? Will you just check yourself out? Will you pay attention? Will you leave this place different today because you heard something from God? Or will you leave the same because you shut him down? Let's don't do that. Let's listen closely to what God has. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God. You need God. So come on, let's stand to our feet and let's go before the Lord. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord. We're incredibly grateful that you have blessed us. Here's our heart, Holy Spirit. Teach us and heal us and strengthen us. Encourage us, guide us, and guard us, and direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. And as we get into your word today, we ask that your word would get into us. Lord, that we not just hear it with our ears and think about it and understand it with our minds, but Lord, it would become part of our heart, our, part of our, if you will, human nature that's just permeated with your presence. And God will give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, as you move mightily in our midst and bless us. We would ask that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless them as our brothers and sisters, and we'll give you the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say, Amen. Amen. Well, while you take your seat and get your Bible, go with me to Luke in the 16th chapter. We're going right into the Word of God. We're talking about freedom for our future. But really, we're talking about not just three things. We're talking about four things. Let me mention the first three that everybody's probably aware of by now that attends the church. We've got this capital stewardship campaign. Let me explain, if I may, what capital stewardship is. The word capital means money or resources. Stewardship simply means to manage. The management of what you have that God gives you. It's capital stewardship campaign. Very important that the money that you and I have from God, because God gives it to us. He owns it all. It's all his, everything you have. Some people say, no, it's my money. No, it's not your money. You didn't earn it. Let me just say this to you. God put you in a business. You, God gets your business. God gets you the job. God gives you the air to breathe, the food to eat, the sleep to have, the rest to have, the health to have. Without God being in there, you wouldn't have anything. It's all God's, and he gives to us, and you have to acknowledge that everything on the planet belongs to the Lord. The proof of that is you were born naked and you're going to leave this place naked. You've heard the old saying many times about there's never a hearse going down the street with a U-Haul behind it and, and they're going to bear, bury it all together. It doesn't work that way. Uh, there's no rich men in the, same, in the cemetery. They're all the same value. Maybe some may have a little more gold in their teeth, but I doubt they'll get through the mortuary with that. And uh, guess what? There's just no rich men in the, in the cemetery. Everything you have, get a picture of this, everything you'll ever have, it's because God gives it to you. It all belongs to him. The question is whether or not you're going to do the right thing with it because it's all based on something very important. How well you manage will determine the amount we manage. Let me say it again. How well we manage will determine the amount we manage. Now, freedom for your future campaign is very, very important for us. Freedom in three areas. 
The three areas is number one, we need to pay off this church because we've got a generation ahead of us. We cannot allow this to be a one generation church. Your children and your children's children could be in this pulpit area. Your grandchildren could be in this pulpit area. Are the other churches that the Rock Church is going to start and preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of you in here say, wait a minute, I've never had minister in my family line. I've, I've never had a preacher in our family line. Don't know anything about that. I doubt whether my kids will ever follow that. Can I tell you something? I am a first generation preacher. I'm not a second, third, fourth, fifth. I am a first generation preacher. And look what God did with me. If God could do it with me, God could do it with your kids and your kids' kids. Second, we're talking about freedom for the future. It's very important for us. Freedom for fi from financial institutions. There's no reason in the world that we need to be slaves to the lender, as the Bible calls it. $86,000 every single month, or maybe it's $87,000 every single month. Every 30 days, we take your tithe and your offering of $87,000, most of which is, is uh, interest and goes to a bank and a lender somewhere. Can you imagine how many people we could feed? Can you imagine how many missionaries we could touch? Can you imagine the buildings we could take? That same 87,000 we could purchase for our schools. Can you imagine La Roca that's out of room in three services? Did you know that we have 11 church services a week. There's not very many churches that have that many church services. And La Roca has got three of them going. They're busting at the seams. Can you imagine what it would be like if we had the finances to build onto the next portion of the freedom for this financial institution? And we take that money and reach our city with it. Which brings us to number three, freedom. The third freedom is freedom for ministry. Freedom for our missions programs. Freedom for our feeding programs. Freedom for the poor. Freedom for the buses. Freedom under the bridges. Freedom for housing. Freedom for taking care of people. Do you know when we have finances, we can take care of people. People say, you've got this great want. Yes, you can have a great want all you want until you get some finances to back your want. It ain't gonna get you anywhere. You can have a great want to do a business, but it isn't going to get you anywhere until you have some finances to develop and start that business. You're going to have to do that. And here it is right in our own midst right now. All we have to do is eliminate that debt that we have every single month. And we can do it as we all gather together and we all extend ourselves and we all sacrifice and we all give. But giving without a heart is not giving at all. Which brings me to the fourth freedom. Freedom for our hearts. Every single one of us need to understand these next few weeks is a development, not just in giving, a teaching not about just giving. It's not a teaching about what God says in Scripture, just about that. It's about what God says in Scripture that touches and changes our heart in order to do the right thing and make the right choices. That's what this is all about. A lot of times people say, how come God just doesn't give me if he owns everything? Why didn't he just give me some more money? Why didn't he just give it? Would it hurt all the heavenly plans? Would it hurt eternity if God just simply gave me more money? Some of us say things like, God, if you gave it to me, I'd give it. But let me tell you something. Maybe that's why the scripture in Luke, the 16th chapter, says what he says. Let's look at it together. Jesus is speaking. Is anybody listening? In Luke, the 16th chapter, Jesus himself is speaking about an unjust steward. A steward, member is one who's managing the resources of someone else. That's what you're doing. You're managing the resources of someone else. His name is Jesus. He owns it all, and it's all his. It's all held together by the power of his might. And you are a manager. And the greater you manage it, the greater he'll give it to you. It's that simple. When you're a bad manager, you don't get much. So therefore, a lot of people come along and say, God, will you give it to me and I'll just give it. And God knows that if he gives it to you, it'll just drive you further away from God. The blessing that God has for you, God does not want to turn into a cursing in your future. 
Let me say that again. The blessing that God has for you, God is not going to let it turn into a cursing in your future. If you know how to manage the resources that God gives you, he'll give you more resources. So here we see this illustration in Luke the 16th chapter of a bad manager of resources. Jesus talks in these terms so that you and I can learn about our own hearts. Watch this, verse number 10. And he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. Just stop right there and think about it. He makes a statement. If you're faithful in the little, you can be faithful in the much. Which means if you're not faithful in the little, you'll not be faithful in the much. So therefore, what you do with what you have says a lot about what you're going to do with when you have more. Did you get that? And all of us that are in here makes this statement. He who is faithful in that least, if it's a little teeny thing and you're faithful on it, then God can trust you with more. That's what he's saying in this verse. The verse goes on and he says these words. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. The word unjust, I should have circled, should have highlighted the word unjust. After all, stop and think about it. Who's just? Is your way just? Is my way just? Is the majority's way just? What's just on this planet? What's just is what God says. So he makes a statement and he says, he who is unjust in what is least is unjust in what is much. And if God said this is a way to do something and you don't do it that way, then you are unjust in what you have. You are unjust making a decision to do something contrary to the ways of God. Even though I might think it's right, even though society says it's right, it's still unjust if the just one isn't in it. So therefore, he who makes a decision that is on the least and has a little bit and treats what he has as if it is unrighteous or unjust, guess what? He'll be unjust with little, but if he has a little and he's just with it, he'll have a lot and he can be just with that. And verse number 11 comes along and says, therefore. I love the word therefore. It's therefore what I just said. If you can't handle the little according to what God says, the just, then you can't handle the much according to what God says. Are you following me? You know, it isn't going to work. Therefore, he makes this statement. If you do not be faithful in the unrighteous mammon, and then he makes this illustration. If, and I love this word, if, it's the biggest little word in the Bible. It means it's an option. You can either do it or not do it. And he says, therefore, if, you have not been faithful and unrighteous mammon. See the word mammon up there? The word mammon, you ought to circle it in your Bible, it means money. It just means money. We all know that. That's God's terms for money. And he says, if you are not faithful in the unrighteous money, who will commit to your trust to riches? Let me tell you something about money. Let's talk about basic economics for a minute. Is that all right? Listen to me closely. I want you to hear this. That in the earth that moves goods and services is economics, basic economics. What moves goods and services is money in the physical realm. What moves goods and services in the spiritual realm is faith. Are you following me? And if you can't even be just and righteous, with the physical realm, God will never entrust to you the spiritual economics in your life. And so for all of us in here, what we do with what we have says a lot about where we're at and what we can handle in the future. Are you following me? So he makes it very clear. He says, therefore, if anyone is unrighteous with an ammon, how will you commit the trust of true riches? God wants to get to you and I true riches. I don't know if anybody's ever said this to you, but God wants to bless you. Verse number 12 comes along. Verse 12 says, and if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, 
And what is another man's? Who's, whose is it? It's mine. No, you got to get that out of your mind. It all belongs to who? God. So another man's, yes, is his master here that he's using as an example. But for us, it's Jesus. And he says, if you haven't been faithful to what I give you, then another man's. Then he said, who will give you what's your own? Now he makes a statement and he says this in verse number 13, which is powerful. And he says these words. Verse 13, no servant can serve two masters. He either will hate the one and love the other, or he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God, and there's that word again, mammon. See, mammon, money, that unrighteous position in the physical realm that moves goods and services in the basic human economics is that which is something that should never be Ah, serving, we serve it, but it ought to serve us. And when you become a slave to the money, instead of the money becoming a servant of yours, we're in the wrong place. So he makes this statement. He says, you cannot serve God and mammon. He didn't say throw the money away. He didn't say get rid of it. He just said, make sure you have the right priorities. Make sure you have the right commitment. Make sure your heart's in the right place. God wants to bless you. I'll show you that in just a moment. God wants to prosper. Can you imagine someone saying this? God wants to prosper your hand. But in order for it to happen, it's going to happen as you line up with God's ways of doing things. Are you following me? Not your ways of doing things. That's why he says this. You can't serve two masters. What's your master? God or money? Therefore, most people in 10 American churches, money still masters over their decision-making process instead of God. And then what happens is you become the slave to the money instead of the money becoming your servant. And when the money becomes your servant, now God can give back to you even more. Is anybody listening? Because without an understanding of that, we absolutely fall and fail. Now watch this. It's kind of fascinating. In Luke, the 12th chapter, go there with me. Just go back a couple of chapters in your Bible. Jesus is speaking once again in verse number 30, talking about all those material things that you and I want, material things that we need. You know you need them. You know you want them. It's okay. God's not against giving them to you. He wants to give them to you. But listen to how he's going to give it to you. Is that okay? Watch this. Verse number 30. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you have need of these things. So God's not against you having a nice home. God's not against you having a nice car. No, no. God's not against you having, you know, some nice clothes and taking care of your kids, put tennis shoes on your children's feet. God's not even against you having a retirement program or having a plan in life that's economically strong for you. God's not against them. God knows, in fact, according to that verse, he knows the things that you're going to need. Why? Because he knows the outcome of this whole entire planet. But notice what it says in verse number 31. But seek the kingdom of God, and these things shall be added unto you. I like uh, Matthew 6, 33, same verse, but it says, seek first the kingdom of God, and all of these will be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of this will be added on to you. So God says, here's the way it works. You got to seek me first, put me first, put it in first God's ways. That's that just way of doing things, not the unjust way of doing things. And I will see that these things will get to you. That's a powerful promise from God. Now watch this. And then he comes along and he says, do not fear little flock. Right after he says that, he says, God knows what you need, and if you'll seek God first, and his righteousness, God will add these things that you need onto your life, so God's not against blessing you. And then the very next verse, he says, fear not. You know what? When you seek God, oftentimes it's contrary to your human thinking. It's contrary to your human feelings. It's contrary to your basic understanding of economics. Money moves goods and services. 
And it does on this earth, but you want to move past the earthly realm into the heavenly realm where faith moves the goods and services of heaven. I need the windows of heaven to open up and pour me out a blessing. I need God to protect my job. I need God to open up the doors. I need God to close the doors. I need God to make it work. And I, in order for that to all happen, I need my $10 to spend like 100 I need my 100 to spend like 1000 In order for that to happen, I'm going to have to get out of the natural economics and get into what moves faith uh, goods and services but faith and that's so wonderful to see so he says don't fear little flock for your father's good pleasures to give you and then he makes a statement did you notice how God doesn't want to just give you clothes and tennis shoes and cars and houses I mean that's cool we'd probably settle for that but that's not what God wants to give you God says I want to give you the Kingdom. Now, if you were to place a value on something, let's think about it for a moment. Which do you think has more value? Tennis shoes, clothes, house, or the kingdom of God? So God says, I want to give you, it's my good pleasure, good pleasure, to give you something that's greater than you can ever imagine. Greater than any wealth you can ever calculate. Greater than all the wealth that the earth has. I don't want to just give you the material stuff. I don't want to just give you the clothes and tennis shoes and the car. But I want to give you the kingdom of God. My goodness, and it's my good pleasure, God says, as he gives, but you can't fear. Very next verse comes out, if you will, in verse number 33, and he says, sell what you have and give alms. Very first thing he says, now have a heart to do this, but don't be afraid. He says, provide for yourself bags which will not grow old, treasures in heaven that does not fail, where no thief of approaches nor moths destroy. But then he goes on and says these words, last words, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now here's the question. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, Whatever it is that you consider of great value is what you have your heart set on. Great value could be the way you live right now. Great value could be your material things that you're living in right now. Great value could be, you know, what we think and society and social systems that we live in. But whatever you place a great value in, your heart's going to be on it. Someone might say to me, well, Pastor Jim, why does God, you know, want us to do this? Why would I want to do this? Because God is really not after your money. God's after your heart. Are you following me? Because where your heart is, is where your treasure is. And that's where the strings, and God knows that there's the strings of our heart oftentimes attached to worldly things more than to the things of the Lord. Is any at all listening to the word of God? Where your treasure is. And that's what we need to examine all the time. So here's life. We oftentimes say to God, God, here I am. Here's what I want you to do, Lord. I want you to give me the finances and then I'll give them back to you. Do you know that doesn't work? Here's how it works with God. Remember, the formula is completely different. I've used this little formula numerous times. You may have heard it from me before. Here's the formula. You cannot sit before a fireplace on a cold, wintry day and say, give me heat, and then I'll put the wood in. It doesn't work. If you want the heat from the fireplace, the formula is don't sit in front of the fireplace and say, give me heat, I'll put the wood in. You're going to have to put the wood in. But did you know that putting the wood in doesn't make the fire? You're going to have to get kindling. You're going to have to get maybe some paper, some small little sticks, get them started first. Then from there, they catch the logs on fire. And then you're going to have to be patient for the heat to come and warm your life and warm your home. Oftentimes, we're impatient with God. Oftentimes, we want to do it our way. And instead of putting in the right formula that gets the heat out, we want to put rocks in the fireplace. Or we don't want the fireplace to be lit at all. Are you following me? 
And God is saying something. If you want something from God, you're going to have to follow the right formula and you're going to have to do it the right way. Not your way or my way or some what we think feeling way. We're going to have to do it his way. And he's telling us something very important, that our heart is where we place our value system. Whatever is valuable to us, our heart follows it. If it's God, wow, then we're going to follow God. If it's material things, then we'll follow material things and they'll hold us. And instead of them being a servant to us, we become slaves to them. And that's what he's talking about. Now, you might say to me, Pastor Jim, why in the world would you teach about money in church? How come you're teaching us about money? Isn't it kind of weird to do that? Why don't we just talk about Jesus? Why don't we just talk about love? Why don't we talk about so much about faith? Why is it that, Pastor Jim, you're talking to me about money? Is it because you want my money? Well, I, number one, don't want your money, don't need your money, don't even look at your money, touch your money, or smell your money. But you need to give because as you give, it shows where your heart is at, and God knows where your heart's at. Well, does God need my money? No. First of all, that's the wrong question. God owns it all, and it's not your money it's his. And you are called by God to what? Manage it. And the greater you manage it, the more God will give to you. Now let me show you something that you might find fascinating. I'll put it up on the overheads for you to learn and for you to see for yourself. I would think that talking about baptism is very important. But did you know that the scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, talks about baptism when God talks in scripture, he talks 40 times in 40 verses about baptism. Well, I would think that uh, prayer is pretty important in church. We ought to talk about prayer more than anything else. Well, did you know that God talks, Old Testament, New Testament, about prayer 275 times? verses in the Bible. Now watch this. I would think that, you know, faith is important. The Old Testament, New Testament. Did you know that God talks about faith 350 verses in the Bible? That's amazing. But listen to this. I would think that love is absolutely the operative word. It is the very ultimate of what God is trying to express to us is love. But did you know in the verses at 650 times in verses, God speaks about love. Now when it comes to finances, watch this. When it comes to material possessions, when it comes to wealth and the management of what he gives you, he talks 300 uh, three, excuse me, 2,350 verses. 2,350 verses. You might stop and say, Pastor Jim, what the heck is that all about? Does God need my money? No, but God knows your heart is attached in the strings of your heart oftentimes to material things of this earth when in fact your heart is supposed to be attached to the things of God. Are you following me? Because giving without having your heart right is no giving at all. And that's why God does this and God says this. Did you know that 15% of everything Jesus talked about in the New Testament is about wealth, money, and the management of money and finances. Why? Because our hearts as human beings always revert back to putting our trust in what we have, confidence in what we can attain, confidence in what we can accumulate instead of in who he is. And our hearts are out of sync when we do that. We stop God completely. Listen to this. Jesus talked, if you will, in Matthew 88 times, the book of Matthew about finances. 54 times in Mark, uh, 92 times in the book of Luke. Listen, can I just say this to you? Listen to me, listen to me, listen, 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 listen. I would be a horrible pastor if God emphasized something as much as this subject in the Old Testament as well as New Testament and then did not bring it to your attention because I was afraid of what you would think of me. 
I'm too old, pushing 70 years old. I don't give a flip what you think of me. I know that I'm going to meet up with God soon, and I'm going to say it like it is. We need to all, including me and my Deborah, check our hearts to make sure that where our hearts are, that is where our value is, and our value is in Christ Jesus. And let me say this to you. The more we manage what he gives us the way he wants us, not in an unjust way, but in an adjust way, the more he will give you because God wants to even go beyond what you can think and give you even the kingdom of God. Somebody ought to give me a, a great big amen. I want to just finish this, this morning, this is setting us up for the future and messages by going to the Old Testament. I'm going to take you to the last book in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. And before I read you a verse, I'm going to set you up with understanding of the verse so that you can properly anal uh, give an analogy, an, an, an understanding of that particular verse of time. We find here that the children of Israel are coming back from 70 years of Babylonian captivity. God allowed them to be taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar 70 years prior. He came in and he swept through because of their disobedience to God. Listen to this, listen, listen, listen. Because of their deceptions with God, they tried over and over and over and over to trick God into believing something. One thing you and I have got to come to a place of understanding. There's no way that you can do something and God know what it is you're not doing. He knows and reads your heart like you can't imagine. And with Israel, here they are. They've come out of captivity 70 years in bondage because they constantly were putting pressure on God, constantly compromising their stand with God in their relationship with God, constantly having a different treasure in their hearts other than God. And the same thing applies to us oftentimes. So God gives an assignment to this prophet Malachi and he speaks to them and it's not easy what he speaks. But what he speaks is preserved for thousands of years for you, preserved for thousands of years for me so that we can understand what God expects from us with our heart relationship towards God. Is that okay? I want to take you to Malachi in the first chapter. Remember, it's the last book of the Old Testament before we get into the New Testament. If you find Matthew, cool, go to the first chapter and in verse number eight of the first chapter of Malachi. He's writing to these people who have been in bondage that are coming back home into Israel. And he's finding them, listen to this, listen, 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 them doing the same thing they did before. There's something about the human nature. We're all the same, whether it's thousands of years ago or today in the year 2013. With human nature is human nature. And it's like they have to deal with issues, we have to deal with issues. That's why the scriptures tells us about it. And he comes and he starts to talk to them. And he makes a statement to them. Can I read the statement to you? In the eighth verse of the first chapter, it says these words. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick as a sacrifice, is it not evil? Stop right there. Look back. At, I mean, let me set the stage for you what they're doing. They were going to bring a sacrifice to God. They're an agricultural community. They were ranchers and farmers. They would find that they needed to bring a sacrifice to the Lord. They needed to give to God. They had no problem. They knew there was a God. They knew they had to give just like you and I do. But what they gave said a lot about where their heart was. They would go into their fields and find a lamb that was sick, one that wasn't going to live, find a lamb that was blind, one that wasn't going to make it, find a lamb that was lame that wasn't going to make it. 
They weren't taking the very best. They were taking the very worst of all of their crops and the very worst of all of their agriculture and of their farming and ranching of their livestock and they were bringing it to God as an offering. We do the same thing. We pay all of our bills and then if we have something left over, we give from the dredge of what we have left over to God. Sorry if that hurts your feelings. Sorry if that pricks your heart, but it's true. I mean, as long as we can cover our expenses, then the heck with whatever it is, I'll give to God, but it'll come out of what I have left over. Instead of it being right off the top, the first thing, the very best, it becomes the worst. And then God writes to them and he says this in verse number eight, he says these words, offer it unto your governor. Would it be pleasing with you? Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? In other words, you can't even give it to the government and expect the government to expect you and pat you on the back for giving the lame and the sick and that which is not good and comes off the top, but only given to the bottom of the heap. Because he says, give it to your governor and see what he says. Now, you know the government today takes it right off the top. Doesn't wait for you to spend and pay your bills and whatever's left over. Then pay your taxes. They get their taxes where? Up front free. They know us humans. <laughs> but so does God. Are you following me? Let's be honest with each other today. Give it to your governor. See what he says about it. Wouldn't get by with him. What makes you think it'll get by with God? God saw it. God noticed it. God said, Malachi, this is the reason you went into bondage in the first place. 70 years and you humans, you haven't learned anything yet. And here we are thousands of years later and our hearts are still attached to material things of this world when God wants to give us the kingdom of God. I love what it says in the, if you will, go with me, the Malachi, the verse 14. But cursed is the deliver, deceiver. But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flocks a male, meaning a healthy ability to give. And takes a vow, I'll give it. But sacrifice to the Lord what is blemished. Bottom of the totem pole goes to God. For I'm a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Fear not, he says to us. But that's a respect thing that we need to be. God doesn't get from the bottom of the dredge. God gets from the top. And if we don't manage what it is that God gives to us, then how can we expect God to give more back to us? Now watch this. In Proverbs, I'm closing this last verse. Proverbs, third chapter. Just pop it up on the overhead. Verse number nine. Honor. This is where your heart comes in. Honor. Respect. Understand the unjust and the just. Understand what God is and what he wants to do. He wants to give you the kingdom. Honor the Lord with your mouth. Coming to church, singing a few songs, carrying your Bible, telling your neighbor about, not, not any of that. I mean, the bottom line, God knows that oftentimes and more times than not, our hearts are still attached to material things. And may I say, we can be outward going great Christians preaching the gospel, but when it comes to our money, don't touch it, preacher. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruit, not off the bottom. Because guess what? I promise you, if you give to God from the bottom or somewhere along the line, he'll wear out your money so much there'll be nothing to give. So you start right off the bat, this goes to God, and then whatever you got left, 90% God, here's how it works, that you're responsible for. And then he takes the 90% because you're obedient and makes it spend like 120, so you get to go play at Disneyland. <laughs> That's the way it works. 
Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruit of all of your increase. Verse 10, what for? So that your barns will be filled with plenty. See, God doesn't want to hold it back. And your vats overflow with new wine. Now remember, this is an agricultural community. They didn't have money going back and forth like you and I did. They traded goods. And a guy that had a barn full of vats of wine was like Bill Gates. A guy that had, if you will, uh, barns filled with plenty is like Bill Gates. God's promise to every single one of us is honoring the Lord with our first fruits, with our possessions. Can't do that if our heart strings are still attached to the possessions of being yours and all you'll have. What God gives you is a replenishable resource. And we think about it in terms as if it's not a replenishable resource. And that's where the shame comes in and that's where we try to deceive God. And God knows. Now look, I could be a pastor that just smiles at you all the time and tickles your ears. I can be a pastor that doesn't preach to you about the truth of the word of God and the heartbeat of God for you. We just come and talk about love and faith and beating up the devil. We all just have a great shout. Or I can be a pastor that loves you enough to share the truth. P truth that not only is in scripture, but as an old man, I've lived all of my life. My Deborah and I have lived this all of our lives. Today, I want to close this with a video of some people from our church. And I want you to watch it. Listen to what they have to say. The economy went bad. We wound up both losing our jobs. We lost our, our home, all of our furniture. We pretty much lost everything. Wound up living with my mom and my little brother in their two bedroom apartment. Um, sleeping on the living room floor because there wasn't enough room. Started coming to church service. Eventually um, wound up getting saved. We started tithing. Every time, you know, we would reach the point of, I have no idea how this bill is going to be paid. And all of a sudden, you know, there's a check you know, our kids would see it, um, and our son would collect pennies to come and bring to church. I think we attended more services without a car than we did when we had, had a, car. a car. We weren't working, so let's be at church as much as possible. It was still hard sleeping on the floor. Yeah, it was still hard sleeping <laughs> on the floor, but we had a home. We didn't have a house, but we didn't argue anymore. Our kids were happy, and finally, um, I got offered a job, and I said immediately, of course, <laughs> yes, they liked me, and once they found out my background, they offered another position, so I wound up getting two jobs. two jobs. When they told me how much the pay was, I we literally, we, we cried. The pay was enough to afford our own place. Our own and, home. And um, our own home. A friend of ours had mentioned a place, it was outside of our budget. Um, but we were, you know, it was actually him that he's like, let's go look at it anyways. And as soon as we walked in, it, it felt like home. We didn't know how we were going to afford it because it was a little bit more than, than his income. Yeah. Um, but God told me, he, he said, if you want this and you believe you can have it. And so I immediately told her, I go, well, we're going to take on faith. We've lived on faith for five years. Let's really apply our faith and believe. Within a couple of days, um, I was offered a job. And it was like it just enough to get our place. I was literally, I couldn't say anything. I was just, all I could do was just praise him because, you know, God saw us first and where we were. And he didn't judge us. Mm -hmm. He didn't condemn us. He loved us through the church. That's what drew us in the most is that yeah. our church is a church of love. That no matter where you've been, where you come from, that once you come to him, all of that stuff has gone away. Today, here's what we're gonna do. 
We're not here today to take your pledge for the next three years. No, no. We could, and you know it. But I hope you see our hearts. We're going to share for the next five weeks. The end of May, then we're going to have a day where we all bring our three-year pledge in, which is over and above our tithe, something extra for the Lord, to do the freedom for our church. That'll be at the end of May. We're not even really asking for any money at that time. We're going to bring our first fruits of our pledge. In other words, the first fruit, we made our pledge in May on our birthday, the 25th of June. On that birthday, which will be 25 years of serving God's people in the Inland Empire, proving the integrity of this ministry over and over again. You can say anything you want. You can say you dislike me. You can dislike me as much as you want. Bottom line, we have 25 years of a pure track record. Mama and I love each other. The staff is healthy and strong. We've taken care of the poor. We're going to continue doing that in great and mighty ways. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Then we're going to bring our first fruit in in June. In other words, the first part of whatever we can in the end of June, our 25th. We're going to celebrate that night with the biggest party you ever saw in the courtyard with dancing and music and fun and excitement and live and, of course, food. <laughs> Somebody give me an amen. <laughs> And so we're going to have a great time as God does something great. Real quick, I'm going to ask you to just to remain seated for a second. I'm literally going to let you go in a different manner today than normal. I'm going to ask Pastor Joel if he'll come and stand in front of me right here. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. It'd be a real tragedy for you to come and hear the Word of God. And you were great listening to the Word of God today. And then walk out of this place, die, and go to hell. You don't have to do that. Today, you can get right with God. Listen to me. Today is your day of salvation. God brought you here not to just hear a message about your heart, a message about finances. God brought you here to give your heart to the Lord, be born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. You do not get to heaven because you're a good person. You do not get to heaven because you're a nice person. You do not get to heaven because you're hoping you're going to make it. You do not get to heaven because you call yourself a Christian. You do not get to heaven because you know who Jesus is. Even the devil knows who Jesus is, and that doesn't make you a Christian. In order for you to get to heaven, the Bible says you must be born again. You're going to have to give God all of your heart. You're going to have to give God all of your life. And that's what born again means. And we want to help you. Pastor Joel and his team will be on the right side, your left side, right over there, and they'll be waiting for you to get out of your seat, walk forward, and pray a simple prayer to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And then he'll give you some free stuff, free information to take home and read about what to do next. It's as simple as that. Now, if you're sitting next to somebody, I want you to check with that person and say to them, come on, I'll go with you. They'll probably say, no, I don't want to do it. All you have to say to them is, today is your day of salvation. Don't walk out of this place being the same when a simple, simple thing like walking forward after everybody's dismissed, you can get right with God by giving God all of your heart, giving God all of your life. Are you hearing me? And inviting Jesus into your heart. You got to invite him to come in. He won't come in because you... You're, he's nice to you or friendly to you. He, he, he went to the cross and died for you. Guess what? So that you can invite him into your heart. It's your heart and your life. Don't leave this place without it. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? Listen, you need to come and give Jesus all of your heart and all of your life. You need to stop messing with God and they'll pray with you and give you some free information. Couldn't get easier. Couldn't get better. Remember, what you do says a lot about who you are and where your heart's at.